All right, y'all thought that I might be fibbing. This is proof right now. The Letterman Podcast. We have one sponsor, one sponsor only, but it is Rupert G and the Hello Deli. Thank you very much for sponsoring our show, Rupert. It's my honor, Mike. La 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 Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. Uh, doing this is my favorite thing in the world. I enjoy hosting this show more than any of you might imagine. Uh, it is so much fun to go back and celebrate um, and, and kind of dive into the background of the greatest body of broadcasting work in history, that of David Letterman and company. It's so cool to talk about some of these little things that happen behind the scenes that might have just been a moment or two uh, that... that Sometimes it's forgotten, and and it's great to jog the memories of some of these people who contributed to this show, uh, in so many and, and entertained and delighted so many people uh, for for decades. And we're just so excited to be presenting these um, long form conversations with people who put this amazing body of work together. Uh, today, I got to tell you, I don't get nervous for a ton of these ones, but I'm nervous for this one. I'll flat out full disclosure it. I'll tell you what the feeling is like. It's like, uh, remember back in high school and, and um, you know, you, you get, you go into your cliques and you're in your groups and you sit down in the classroom uh, based on, you know, the seats that you want with people that you may be familiar with. But every once in a while, things get jumbled, randomized. Uh, maybe you're going on a field trip and suddenly you're placed beside somebody that you're going to sit with for 45 minutes. Uh, today's, the nervousness that I feel is very akin to that. I feel like I'm in grade eight and I suddenly got sat for 45 minutes beside the coolest girl in school that I've never talked to, but I always know, oh my God, I'm sitting beside the coolest girl in school and we have to chit chat for 45 minutes. That's what today's nervousness feels like. Uh, I've talked a lot about how much I'm a music fan and um, music has been tied to David Letterman's uh, presentations and programs from the very beginning, including to the things that he's doing right now as the time of this broadcast. Uh, the, the the special with U2 is about to drop uh, on the Big Mouse's network. That's going to be really, really cool. I think about uh, even on my next guest, he's had, you know, Jay-Z and Kanye and some of these amazing larger than life musical acts on and and. I look at Late Show as kind of the zenith, the big platform, the big stage of David Letterman's, um, you know, nightly broadcasts, and music was such a part of it. The architects behind what we saw on screen, the musical, the the CBS Orchestra, um, you know, led of course by Paul Schaefer, but everybody had their role in the band. We've had a couple of them on here already. I am so thrilled to say we have another one here. Uh, a gal that uh, on the on my magical night seeing Dave um, on April 20th, 2015, my wife proclaimed as we watched her turn around and walk home after the broadcast, my wife proclaimed that is the coolest chick on the entire planet. I could not agree more. Felicia Collins, thank you so much for coming on the Letterman podcast. This is a big deal for me. Wow. Well, thank you for inviting me, Mike. Man. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm we've excited trying, we've too. We've been trying to make this happen for a while, you know. I, so uh, I am tenacious with a capital T, yes. But <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, respectfully tenacious. I don't ever want to be a bug to people. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I, I, I'm I, I'm very grateful that you finally succumbed to, uh, uh, to my pestering. <laughs> and this is, you know, this is the way to get me off your back. So this is, you, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this. I appreciate it very, You're very welcome. much. You're welcome. Um. Before, okay, so by the way, part in, in, but don't let me finish the episode here uh, without us talking about what's going to be happening with Sly and the Family, your, your Sly and the Family Stone uh, concert that's coming up. We're going to take a video of that and we're going to put it out there uh, like early before this episode drops as a commercial. I'm really excited about that. Uh, the first question I have for you is, is um, you know, the late show ended. Uh, you know, uh, May twentieth, twenty fifteen. You know, so we're we're getting on almost eight years from that time. In that time, you've dropped an album. You've done all sorts of different performances all the time. Um, are you playing? Are you playing as much? Maybe not as much as you were back then, because you had a nightly gig. But um, what have you been doing since the show ended? Well, I've been playing more with my own band than I was able to. Um, back when I was doing Letterman, because, you know, we had to be 
be there every night, every day and every night. But I'm getting to do more stuff with my, my different bands now. I have a few bands, so it keeps me busy. And I've been doing a lot of writing. And, you know, we can do sessions now from, from our home studio. So I've been doing a lot of recording with people. And in a way, I'm busier than I was when I was going to work every day down at the Ed Sullivan Theater, which I miss, by the way. I can oh, imagine you do. Oh, God, I miss I miss that routine, Mike. You know, it was just, it was perfect for me because I've never been one that wanted to like claw up the recording artist ladder and all that BS. I just like to play. And yeah. I like to play with people who can play. And I like to, it, I had the perfect gig to play with everyone I ever admired. <laughs> I could actually end up playing with them. And it, it was all I needed. That was all I needed. I didn't need fame or anything. You know what I mean? I just wanted to do that. Well, it's interesting, you know, and you have talked about this a little bit before, but there's not a ton out there um, that's right in your face about the origin. I, I love the benefit of hindsight looking back because at the end of the day, when you think about it, you kind of hesitated at first when you got the call from Paul to, to to take the gig in the first place. And it's really neat booking and bookending it, talking about how the, some of the hesitations that you had ended up being some of the things that you missed the most. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, because I didn't know that it was going to be, you know, exactly what I wanted. I just, you made Paul I sweat have, for a couple of days, right? Well, I, not intentionally. <laughs> I just didn't know, like, what it was. You know, I just, I mean, TV was foreign to me. I, I was a musician that would, I had been on tour a couple of times already with um, uh, Al Jarreau and Cindy yep. Lauper. And as a matter of fact, it was the last day of the Cindy Lauper tour. I was in LA. We had just come back from doing Leno because uh, he was the host of the Tonight Show at the time. And yeah. when I came in, there was a note that I had gotten a call, you know, call your mother, important. So I called, you know, the hotel had left that note for me, that message for me. So I called her and uh, she said, Felicia, Paul Schaefer called me. And I said, Paul Schaefer called you? <laughs> I was like, Paul Schaefer from TV, Paul Schaefer? <laughs> and she said, well, it sounded like that voice of his. I'm pretty sure it was him. He said, he got, got your number from Nile Rogers. I said, yeah, that sounds about right. He said, what did he want? He said, he, well, he wanted me to, to uh, give you, he, he wanted your number to get in touch with you. But I told him I would take his number and uh, give it to you so you could call him. And I just said, that is so typical of my mother. She would never <laughs> give my mother out, my number out, not even to Jesus Christ. She would say, <laughs> you know what, Lord, I appreciate you're looking for my daughter, but let me take your number and I'll have her call you. And so I called Paul and that's when he told me that, um, he says, I'm sure you've heard about all this going on with Letterman getting a new show. And, I was like, well, yeah, I'd have to be on a different planet not to yep. know it. It was like the biggest news ever. And he said, well, I am um, I want to talk to you about joining the band. And I said, really? I said, what happened to Sid? And he said, I still got Sid. I want to expand the band. And that's when he told me he wanted to add me and Bernie, Mor uh, Bernie Worrell. Yep. On keyboards and as well. I was, I was just, I mean, it was, I was excited to be in a band with those cats, but I didn't know how to do a TV show. I was like, I don't know what to do on a TV show. Is that the kind of thing I know how to do? I, I, it just seemed so foreign to me. I really didn't think it was something that I was, that I belonged to, you know? So right. I, I had to think about it because I sure didn't know at the time of that phone call what, what I thought about it. So I asked him if I could get back to him. And he says, sure. He says, like, how long? I said, I don't know, give me. I don't know, about five days. He says, okay. He says, but let's not push it too much further than that because we, we got to get moving on rehearsals and lock it down. I said, okay, I'll call you in five days. <laughs> and so I remember going out to lunch with some friends of mine out in LA. And uh, I, and I asked Al Jarreau about it too. So we're, we're sitting there at the, in the restaurant. I had Al on one side my friend Jackie from high school on the other side. Yep. And uh, I was telling him, I said, listen, I said, I want to stay in town because I'm going to make myself meet Janet Jackson. She's getting ready to go out on her on tour. 
And I know if I, you know, I can make myself meet her. I just know I sure. can vibe it into existence. Manifest it. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Al was like, Felicia, who's in Janet's band? I was like, I don't know. He said, exactly. <laughs> 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 he said, more people will know who you are on one night, that first night of taping David Letterman, yep. than if you did 10 tours with Jan Jack. And so um, I said, okay, but like, what, but what is the gig? I'm not sure what the gig is. And then my friend Jack from high school goes, Felicia, you know what the gig is? The gig is every day and steady. How about that, huh? <laughs> I said, no, that's- How old were you? How old were you at that? How old were you At the then? time? Yeah. I think I just turned 29. Yeah. Yeah. Like crazy. Like when you think about it and we're going to, before we, you know, we're going to get to the, the, the late show part of it here, but I got to go back before that, because I mean, I, I think about some of the experiences you had in your twenties, um, you know, from your first public performance at live aid in 85, you were like 21. If I did the math, right. Like, <laughs> like that is, that is bonkers. Uh, you know, N Nile Roger, uh, you know, N Nile Rogers, like, holy cow. Um, I think about, uh, I think about good times. And I mean, that song to this day is being sampled and, and, and you having the, uh, the pedigree of the skill where you can kind of play the guitar very similar and, and, and can kind of mimic him and being known for that live aid, one of the biggest concerts on the planet, you're 21 years old playing with a couple people that you would end up playing with later on in life, which is so interesting how things, yeah, fall, right? you know, circle back. Yeah. Um, you know, most musicians don't get a regular gig like that ever. Never mind, you know, before they're even 30 years old, uh, I just, I, I really look at your career and think, oh my goodness, this is somebody who, uh, you know, I don't, as, as, as renowned as you are and the things that you've done, I just, where's the book? Where's the movie? Like, this is a, a an unbelievable career that you've experienced. Um, uh, you know, Live Aid in 85, uh, when you stepped on that stage with the Thompson twins, like as a 21 year old, how do you even fathom that? Like, did you just grow up really fast or did you just grow up on the run? Like, how did, uh, how did that happen? Um, well, that's a lot to unpack there. A lot of you can unpack any of it you want or none of it, if you like, uh, whatever, whatever well, you like. I heard, I heard, how did I get there? And I heard, how did it feel at the time? There you go. Okay. So the way it felt at the time was very exciting and I remember Niall watching me, making sure that I was going to be okay because he thought I would be overwhelmed. But actually, I was thinking it's, a, it's about time. Like that's you know that's how I was feeling. Like yeah, okay, this oh. is what now we're talking. That's how I felt up there. Wow. <laughs> and Niall said at one point he looked over at me just to check on me. He said, and I was like dancing to the music and like grooving like. Like I'd done this a million times, but I guess in my head I had, I, I wasn't nervous. I was just happy. I was so happy. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking, I said, you know, my career is probably going to be blessed because my first step out like this is on this level and it's for a benefit to help somebody. It wasn't even like a paid gig or anything. It wasn't about business. So the whole thing was so joyful and so magical and and I really felt like I was going to be blessed after that. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I looked at that performance and, 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 and again, anytime that I saw you there, that's exactly what it looked like. It looked like, it looked like joy personified. You, you <laughs> just looked joyful up there. Um, working with, uh, Niall, a lot of people may not know his name, but you, you certainly will know his work. Um, in many ways, I think the, uh, the sound of the early eighties and early to mid eighties, uh, was driven the way that, you know, some people say that Pharrell um, or some of these other super producers have have driven what uh, the, the sound and the style of sound will be in the next, you know, few years here. Niall is certainly one of those people that did that. Um, at the time, did you know you were working with kind of a musical genius and just, uh, you know, or were you just playing and just happy to be playing? Of course I knew. I mean, that's yeah. why I I met him. I met him on purpose because <laughs> I, I wanted to know him. And actually, um, well, actually, the way I met Niall, I was playing in a band 
um, I think I was probably like in my late teens or maybe I just turned 20 or something like that. And a friend of the band's had invited, she knew Niall and she invited him to come to our rehearsal. And uh, he just really fell in love with the band, we could tell, but then we never saw him again after that. And then I was going to the movies with the bass player of the band mm -hmm. uh, one evening, I was driving his car and I was parking and I happened to be parking on Niall's block and and my friend Zarek, Zarek Foster, God rest his soul, he was our bass player, one of the mm -hmm. baddest bass players that ever lived. He said, he said, oh shoot, there's Niall. I said, where? He said, over there, that guy walking his dog. And there was this guy walking this little Jack Russell Terrier. And I rolled down the window. I was like, yo, Niall. So he looked up like, who's that? <laughs> so he, he actually walked over to see who it was. He was like, oh, wow, how you doing? I said, hey, Niall, remember us? He goes, yeah. He goes, I, you know, I wanted to sign you guys, but that manager of yours, I said, manager? And I said, oh. I knew, and we knew who he was talking about. We didn't have any manager. So I said, well, listen, I guess it was meant to run into you because we don't have a manager. So I don't know what that boy told you. But um, anyway, I said, I said, let's exchange numbers. Because he, he said, let me get your numbers. I said, how about we exchange numbers? And then um, I just kept in touch with him after I called him probably like about a couple of weeks later. And he yeah. invited me down to the studio where he was working at the time, which I think was the power station. And uh, he told me to bring my guitar. So I grabbed the guitar and I went to run out of the house, but then I forgot to ask him where the studio was. So I had to call him back. <laughs> 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 Jump in a cab and went down to the power station. And he was um, mm. recording Jeff Beck at the time. So that's when I met Jeff. And um, we were just sitting in the room jamming on guitars and and he was just kind of he was smiling and giggling and like because i he thought i played just like him but i think we were both influenced by the same things okay uh, yeah yeah because i didn't i mean i didn't mimic him i just I, I, thank you for saying that i was gonna ask that was my next question he has a very very specific style like when you listen to good times or you know grandmaster flash or daft punk whoever whichever incarnation of that that you hear he has a very specific style but yeah. you didn't mimic it. You just happened to be similar. Yes. Gotcha. You put it perfectly. So that so we just stayed friends after we became friends that night. And he he really respected me as a musician and and just loved having me come around and play and then ask me for ideas when you know when he was mixing and stuff. Cause I was so into the music and I was so happy to just be sitting there at the board with his engineer and going to, you know, try muting right there and like doing the time, he would say, okay, you do it when the timing comes and I would do it off and on and and just things like that. I was in heaven. I couldn't believe I was there and that was happening. And he's, and Niall's the one that opened that door for me to, to just jump right into it like that on that level. And, um, you know, it, it was a great ride from, from then on out. It was fantastic. Yeah. And again, you're a kid. Um, in the studio, I don't know the answer to this question, but so it might might be no, but did you get to, when you were in the studio with him, did you hear him monkeying around with any, uh, like any of his Bowie stuff or his Duran Duran stuff or his uh, Madonna stuff? Like, I mean, the list goes on and on. Did you hear him monkeying around with things that would become iconic at the time? Um... Not specific parts to specific songs, yep. but just his style. Like he, like just picture like a a Nile cloud. Yeah, and he just like puts on his guitar and and has some of it rain down on him at any given time. So then when you hear it on a record, you you just know that that's it came from his pool. You know what I mean? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, like when you look at the list and you start comparing these songs you can feel the through line through the music. And, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, and, and again, there are some people like Timbaland is another example of that in more of the modern age. Many times you can pick that out. You can pick out that that's who produced that. I would say that Niall is also uh, got that in, you know, uh, Rick Rubin's another one too. You can, you can many times pick what's been produced by Rick Rubin many times. There's signatures there. There's mm -hmm. a feeling of some sort, an energy even. Um, right. and, and you got to experience that in your formative years, uh, which is amazing. 
um, no doubt. Um, you uh, so you have this relationship with him. It leads to all sorts of different opportunities, including uh, playing with the Thompson twins. And um, at that time, you met Will and Anton, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember meeting them? Was that just a oh hey of nice course. to see you, and then you happen to see them later, or did a, like a, a dynamic continue on? No, I knew that. exactly who they were because they'd been on TV since since I was in like high school or or something like that, you know, yep. way back. And uh, so I, of course, I knew who they were. That's when I I also met Philippe Says for Live Aid as well. Yeah. And and Rob Sabino, and that's when I met Mick Jagger. Like you know. <sighs> It, it was a 21 a you're 21 it was an awesome time it, it was great because to me I was just do I was just playing I was doing the music and it mattered I was gonna say it didn't matter who was there but it did because those people I looked up to and of course they were huge people but the excitement for me was just the, that I was glad I was being uh given the opportunity to play yeah and that I could participate and, and and enjoy this. It was it was phenomenal. It was, you know, it was it was the only way it was ever going to happen for me because I never studied music or or landed in, into any channels that the, where the current would flow me there. So it had to it had to come as a gift. That was the only way it would ever happen for me. I love the way you put that. That is so. Uh... Uh, it's whimsical. It's awesome. Um, the uh, I, I'm gonna we're gonna get to the for the Letterman fans. We're gonna get there, okay? But you know, I'm a huge music fan, so this is this part. We could do an entire podcast just on this. Um, I, I want to ask about Al just a little bit here uh, because I mean, Al, of course, associated with I think probably the biggest song would probably be "We Are the World." I would think, uh, you know, because that was a that was a culture breaking song. Did you ever meet Quincy Jones back then? I met Quincy. I can't remember exactly when, but you know, it's been many, many years since then. Yeah. So <laughs> I've been around Quincy a few times. <laughs> uh, yeah, I bet. I bet. And that's, uh, oh, there's a lot of stories. I love his doc. I watched his doc a couple of times over the pandemic. I just love that. Uh, the history that's there and, and, and how you got intertwined in that. And then also, uh, you know, becoming part of, you know, the his the stuff that we look at now is history. It wasn't history back then. You were a part of it uh, moving forward. Let's talk a little bit about, before we get to Late Show, uh, Cindy Lauper. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, there were two female artists that broke kind of around the same time. And if I would have had to bet all the money in my pockets, which one would become, you know, kind of a global icon, Cindy Lauper or Madonna, I would have actually picked Cindy Lauper. I, I, the, the She's So Unusual album and all the things that were around that, right. uh, she was breaking so big and, and it just, her talent is just so evident um, that that tour that you got to play on must have been insane. Oh, that was great because um, it was a brand new album that she was promoting and she was going out, she picked a tour as a way to promote the new album rather than, I don't know, videos or whatever else. Is that the one with True Colors? No, no, this is after that. This album okay. was called uh, Hat Full of Stars. Oh, Hat Full, okay, yeah, yeah. And it was like the most beautiful album. And what she wanted to tour, doing only that material. So we were, you know, <laughs> rehearsing. It was all new band, I think, except for her bass player, who was her musical director at the time, um, Ron Jenkins, and uh, in an all new band. And uh, we were just rehearsing only that album. And we rehearsed for a couple of weeks before she joined, she joined the band and she came. And I remember telling her at rehearsal, that um, I said, you know, people are going to ask <laughs> for, I said, Cindy, we're only going to do just this material. I said, this material is strong enough to carry a whole concert. I sure. said, but you know, people are going to ask for, <laughs> for something. Yep. Uh, yep. Girls just want to have fun or true colors or, you know, something, you know, yep. they're going to ask for that stuff. And she was like, I don't care. I, ah, go, if I got to do girls just want to have fun. One more time, I'm going to shoot myself. And I said, well, why don't you flip it? She goes, flip it. What do you mean? What does that mean, flip it? I said, like, do, well, do like an island version. like a The reggae, reggae version. version. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> she thought about it. She said, what would that sound like? So we worked it up in rehearsal and she liked it. And then that's that's what we would do when someone 
She would wait for some the, the fans to shout it out and demand it, even though she had their attention for the entire new album. Nobody shouted out anything until we finished that album. And that's how strong that material was. And then, sure enough, somebody would, you know, ask for that song and we would play that version of it. And she loved it. So she ended up actually recording it that way. That is fantastic. Um, yeah. Oh, I did not. This is, this is why I do the podcast. I love that. I love that version of that song, by the way, when it, because when it, uh, it's been, I think it's been on either a live album or, or there was some sort of greatest hits where it's, it's, it's come out since then. It's out there. Right. And to know that you were part of the origin of that uh, incarnation of that, of that anthem. That's yeah. really, really cool to know that. Well, I, thought, I thought that was the way to get it in there without her being bored to death doing it the same old way. Uh, and shout out to Cindy Lauper. Like she is a, for those who haven't, you know, kept up with her, she's had a few very, very cool gems. If you just go search for it, like her version of Please Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood is one of my favorite versions of that song ever recorded. It's so, wow. so strong. It's really, really beautiful. Um, I, I love that we talked about this at the, time the were the psychotic cowboys around this time the psychotic cowboys is the name given to the band that played for the thompson twins at live Aid. oh that's okay so that's okay that's and that the, was okay. a, that was alana alana curry the member of the thompson twins who gave us that name <laughs> gotcha so anton and will part of that as well then yeah yeah that's when i met anton and will yeah um Speaking of Will, he asked me to ask you about uh, uh, Out Loud. Oh, right. right. That was Out Loud. Okay. I try and research this as best I can, Felicia. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job. I was like, wow. Okay. Out Loud. So uh, this is what Out Loud. Out Loud is a band, a uh, three-member band, Nile Rogers, Philippe Says, and myself. And that came about when... Uh, I think Niall, you know, he was like the biggest producer on Warner Brothers at the time. And they also gave him a deal for him to do a few uh, solo albums. Right. And he had done two already. And this third one, he wanted to make it a band. So uh, he called me, I was living in the village at the time on Horatio Street and I was with Al. And he called me up and uh, told me, you know, that he wanted to make good on his third solo album, but he wanted to do it as a band. How would I like to be a member of the band? I said, of course. He says, and you can, you know, come on in, we can use some of your songs and you can be the lead singer. And I was like, wow. And I said, who else is in the band? He said, so far, Philippe says. And I was like, I'm there, because I love Philippe. And it was just the three of us, it was a trio. And, um, we started recording before we had a name of, of the group. And at the time, Philippe, he was like way into like comic books and stuff. <laughs> and he, there was always comic books laying around on the in the studio. And I was looking at one. And you know how in comic books they have the, um, you know, the bubbles for the speaking or the thoughts. Yeah, thought bubbles or yeah, dialogue yes. bubbles. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I got comics laying around right here. There we go. Just like that. And and within that text, you know, there'll be like a every other word will be like a bold font. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be like, you know, like that. So I just it was some sentence one of the here the superheroes was saying, you know, we gotta get out of here before it gets too loud or something like that. <laughs> and the word out and the word loud were in bold print. And that's how I came up with the name out loud. <laughs> it was that stupid. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, what kind of music was it? And can people find it? It was, um, I, geez, what kind of music was that? It, it was <laughs> kind of a, it was a little bit experimental. Yeah. Like I, yeah, I, I brought one song in. Niall liked the song that I, that he had heard that I wrote um, a few years before that. And he wanted to do it and he wanted to do it exactly like my demo. So he wasn't even there the day we recorded it. I remember I was sitting there by myself and then Philippe came in and put the horns on for me. <laughs> but I, all I did was copy exactly what I did on my demo. Only it sounded, you know, a lot better at the at uh, Skyline Studios, you know, with, <laughs> with Philippe playing, you know, so. Um, 
Yeah, those songs were, it, I, it was sort of like funky pop, I guess, okay. dance, yep. funk pop dance. And it, it was kind of experimental. It was different. I don't know if people knew how to get with it or not. It was know? It was very Nile, it sounds like. <laughs> like that just, you just kind of yeah, described. Yeah, well, by then know, he like... had his, his signature sound because he was using that Synclavier. And yep. that, that Synclavier had a, a sound of its own. You know, everything, all the drums were programmed on that and stuff. And, it sounded exactly like everything that he, you know, he was working on at the time, sound-wise, not song-wise, but sound, I think. At the time, we're going to get, okay, Letterman fans, we're getting there. We're, we're almost there. Just one last question before we get to uh, your first couple of weeks at the Ed Sullivan Theater. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to talk about that uh, because of the change between the world's most dangerous band and the CBS Orchestra. And, and there were significant changes. The style, everything got bigger. I can't wait to get into this with you. But um, at the time, and, and maybe the answer is still the same, uh, but at the end of the day, Will, when he was on, brought up a really good point. Um, back then it was easier to be a music fan of everything. My question for you is, is what were you a fan of back then? What's the type of music that was your go-to? My, my inkling is that you're going to say everything, a little bit of everything, but, um, you know, if you can remember back then it was so easy, every genre, the, the, the release schedules of music that would get out there, uh, was very, um, uh, organized there, there, you could, you could kind of almost be a fan of everything. Just like you could watch almost every TV network. If you wanted to, there was only three networks. Um, obviously things changed along the way. Do you remember what you were a fan of back then? What stuff you listened to? Mm -hmm. I sure do. And, and I'll start by saying that gig expanded my taste so broadly. Because when I started, I was straight up with the funk. I was a funk girl. I was a yep. funketeer. Yes, I was. And um you know, and I, I grew up, you know, I when I was going out, started going out at 14, 15, that was at the height of disco. Yep. And, um, you know, anything with a groove, you know, black music, quote unquote, funk, dance, rhythm and blues, that was my thing. There wasn't a lot of rock and roll. There was certain songs like on Top 40 radio that that just infiltrated into me just from hearing it growing up and stuff. And, but as far as just, you know, what came out my heart to play, not so much rock and heavy metal, and uh-uh. But when I got into this uh, Paul's band, the world's most dangerous band, you know, I was just so excited and open to to play whatever was being dished out for me to learn that it, I was I wasn't hearing it as someone on the you know tuning in the radio to see what I wanted to listen to because. A lot of those songs, I would have just dialed it right past it, you know. Right. But to be sitting there learning it for to play, you know, in this new experience, it I heard it in a whole new way, whole new way. Like for instance, one story that Paul still cracks up to this day is our first rehearsal. <laughs> you know, we had run a few songs, we did some P funk and this and that and the other, and so then we took a little break. And he put on the tape for what we were, after the break, what we were going to start on next. And it was, uh, the kids are all right by the hook. And he had it blasted. He turned it on and it blasted. And I remember it like, I, I shook like, oh my God. I literally had to walk out of the room. I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm ashamed to say it today, but you know, at that moment I was like, oh my God, like, you know. I had to go out of the room and Paul and Will thought that shit was hilarious. <laughs> but now I love it. You know, I'm like, I got my guitar slung low. I'm like, <laughs> 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 I had to acquire the taste. And then eventually, you know, like I said, I was so open to, you know, you hear it in a whole nother way. And there's a whole different appreciation for it when you actually learn the song yourself. Yes. Um, <laughs> that is hilarious. Like I, I, I love the idea that this experience. You said yes to it. You had to, you know, you got in there, and then you start getting stretched, and yeah. and and I, I, I dig that very, very much. Um, before we get to CBS Orchestra, there were a couple times that you did perform with the world's most dangerous band on late night. On late night in Rockefeller Center, were you not there? Do I? I have wrong. I don't think I have wrong. No, no, no. I was. Nah, 
No, first time I, was. I don't okay, think so, I had. I don't think I was of age yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have you it in would. my head at the very end. You did. I might. Uh, I might be wrong oh, here. Don is typing you... something. He might. There might be something there. I might have gotten it wrong though. No, um, I think I know what you're thinking of. Okay. The last week uh, before he closed the show on the old on NBC, the late night. Yes. The, I think the last week one of the guests was Cindy Lauper. Oh, there I, it is. oh, Don. Yeah. Cindy Lauper, yeah. 1993. There it is right there. Okay. Yeah. And I had just started. I literally, we just started with Cindy and I think that was our first gig out. Oh my God. That's so funny. Yeah. And it wasn't even the whole band. It was, um, I think Jan Pulsford on keys. Yeah. Me and maybe the background singers, uh, Catherine Russell and yep. uh, Chrissy Faith. I think those, I think it was just us with Cindy. And, and the world's most dangerous band. Okay, so you performed on Letterman, but you were with Cindy Lauper at the time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. March May twenty seventh, ninety three, a month before the last late night. So there it is. Okay. Um, Thanks, Don. That <laughs> I know, I know that, that band. Th okay, everybody. This is where we bridge it over. Letterman fans, relax. We're gonna get to Letterman right now. This is where the bridge happens. So, so the question that I have for you is: the world's most dangerous band uh, and the CBS Orchestra are very different animals because. Uh, for a variety of reasons, not just because of the size and the and the and the the different instrumentation, but also because, you know, many times the world's most dangerous band would play with an artist or the lead singer of a band or something like that. They would come on and kind of collaborate. Yeah. Whereas um, what you guys did at the CBS Orchestra was much bigger. Um, you know, very much a rock concert. If you went into the Ed Sullivan Theater, yeah. um, you know, you guys played. It wasn't just uh, playing the beginning of a song at the beginning of the bumper, the end of the song at the end bumper. You played all the way through. The energy was insane. Uh, a very different gig. You got hired as one of the extra pieces of the new incarnation of the band. Um, what were the initial meetings like? With was it was it all Paul leading the new vision of what was going to be? Was Bones? already um i guess he wouldn't have been there at the beginning he it was wasn't just, there it was yet just, yeah he wasn't even there yet so what was the initial what were the initial meetings like uh in talking about what the band was going to be you and sid um you know lead rhythm was that even a consideration or was it just a let's see how we collaborate was that even a consideration or was it just a let's see how we collaborate uh, a little bit of both like first of all when, when i called paul back on the <laughs> Okay, we had a little delay there, but we're uh, we're back now. Uh, technical difficulties, everybody. Somebody must have kicked out the plug or something. Um, uh, we're back. We're talking. We're right at the part where, uh, um, you know, she had just taken the gig, and it was a matter of uh, what is going to be different between, um, you know, what's going to be different with the CBS Orchestra. How is it going to be different? Um, you know, you've got two guitars now instead of one. Is is it a matter of um, you know, Sid being a lead, uh, or, 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 or rhythm or vice versa. Um, the different styles of music, we've already talked about how, you know, the different styles were those first few meetings where you were figuring out what it was going to be. Um, was the rehearsal space in the Ed Sullivan theater? Did you guys have your own special place where you were kind of, uh, deciding what the band was going to look and sound like, or, um, yeah, if you could just describe the first, the preparation for, uh, for late show. Well, when we first started, it was uh, we had a, a room, a big studio, rehearsal studio locked out at SIR, which was a, a huge rehearsal facility for, you know, big productions in Midtown, not not too far from the Ed Sullivan Theater. It used to be on 50th Street, I think, between 8th and 9th. And... Um, yeah, Would Broadway had, shows rehearse in there? That kind of a thing? Is that what it was set up for? You know, probably. I mean, they had a, they had a lot of big production rooms, like like any TV show or special or like the Grammys or Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Anything that required a huge stage, that was um, the place to rehearse. Cool. So, you know that you know if you had a crew and a production, you know, like normally just. Like me and my my trio rock band, we wouldn't book SIR. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> but something you know a something that had a big production and a crew. You know, you would you would use SIR to to do your thing. So we rehearsed in there. I think we had two weeks prior to the first taping, which was uh, I, it might have been August 
30th or 31st. Uh, yeah. God can tell you. It was one of That's those- not a lot of time. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the, tape, <laughs> the first taping was August 30th, I think, or either August 31st, yep. 1993 Three. or something. Yeah. Yeah. And we had two, we started two weeks before that. Uh, that is or, not a lot of time. Yeah. But, <laughs> I, you know, I was given, we, we had like a, a repertoire to start with of about 25, 30 songs or something like that. Okay. So we knew, we, we knew that was going to be our first uh, rotation. Yep. So we just went in the studio and jammed those out and got used to playing with each other and the band sounded great. And, I was just thrilled to be up there playing with these guys I'd been watching since I was, you know, a school kid, you know, it was great. It was great. You know, and and I remember thinking like, man, Willie and those guys, they they were very young at the time too. Cause up until then talk show bands were like big bands. Doc Severinsen, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So they were the first like loose band playing james brown and like the beatles and stuff you know uh, did you do any vocals in that first 25 to 30 pieces that you guys uh were, no. were getting for the shape you no vocals at that point you were just Not straight up all. guitar we were strictly an instrumental band for like the first i don't know maybe two or three years yep yeah and then i don't know what happened something I had to sing a christmas bit something you know and then we just little by little by little we started easing in the vocals and turned out we had a bunch of lead singers uh, will lee paul yep um bruce kapler on yep. sax and al chez so we you know it was great to have a band like five lead singers in the band it was fantastic oh yeah like your backup your your whenever the the, the band needed to back somebody up or or, or some the backup vocals that you guys did were fantastic and then whenever one of you would take lead on something it was really good as things progressed. Um, okay, so, but at first, instrumental band. What about during the warm up? Like the famous, to me, the famous one is Dance to the Music, Sly and the Family Stone, how you guys right. would get the crowd going. Um, that wasn't at the very beginning then. I think we start, we had a warm up, a warm up at the very beginning, but I think we used to start with uh, synchronicity. Uh, the police. The, yeah, I think that was our first. We first began with synchronicity and, you know, gosh, I can't remember what the other two songs were, but I know we began with synchronicity Yep. and then did two other songs. And then, you know, then Don says the Rolling Stones as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, As Don was a brown sugar. <laughs> he'll tell us in a second he can hear you too so he can he'll tell us in a second um he thinks Thank that God it was he says that's it that's it brown sugar <laughs> he says uh yeah. he thinks it was after 9 11 that actually the vocals came into things so that that's very interesting oh, that okay. it would be that long before the vocals started uh really kind of penetrating what you guys did yeah um Oh, that's, that's so, okay. So, so you started with uh, a smaller repertoire. Now, now Dave is famous for, um, you know, loving music for uh, wanting to monkey with what you guys did, like asking for songs, Mm -hmm. sometimes at very short notice. Uh, And, and so at the beginning, when you guys are doing these rehearsal shows, did Dave ever show up and request something? Was Morty coming in to check on to see how things were progressing? Or were you basically guys left alone to, to to build what you were building and then you just started uh, rehearsing in the theater and piecing it together then? Well, we only rehearsed at SIR just before we started taping the show. So a couple of weeks most. Like, yeah, not, yeah. Not so long. after okay. that, everything was done in the theater, except for when we were going to add songs and we, you know, we'd have an outside rehearsal for that. Right. But we, we started with our, our little 30 song repertoire but then, you know, like these guys, they know every song ever recorded. So it was just a matter of time before other stuff just started filtering in just on a whim. Like maybe um, the movie star guest, she might say, you know, the first concert I ever went to, my father took me to see <laughs> yep. whatever, sign yep. a family stone when I was 10. And so then Paul would look at us and go, okay, we got to play slide here. So, so then we, you know, we would just play thank you or something, you know? Yep. And so little by little, just, we just started playing other songs outside of that 
that first uh, 30 song rotational repertoire. And just after that, just uh, American pop became our repertoire, everything. Absolutely. Well, I'll remember, I'll give you, I'll give you an example just from, uh, from my point of view, because I always like to make it about me. Um, one of my favorite, one of my favorite bands in the world is a band called Nine Inch Nails. And yes. I remember after Woodstock, remember in Woodstock 90, uh, 93, 94, um, Nine Inch Nails 99. made a, a really big splash. Not Woodstock um, 99, right, Don? No, it wasn't 99. It was, <laughs> it was 99 was the train wreck. This was the, uh, uh, 94, I think it was, um, oh. or 93. I, I forget which year it was. Donald, Donald, tell me. Uh, yeah. But anyway, after that weekend uh, performance, yeah. Dave starts talking about Nine Inch Nails, and he, oh, let's get them on the band. Let's get them on the band. Let's get like he he let's get them on the show. I should say. Um, and within a couple of days, you guys were playing Hurt as one of the bumpers um, oh, yes. uh, before commercials and, and things like it just it was so fast. Or I think about Eddie Vedder, uh, you know, the Eddie Vedder moment. That's early on, too, when, you know, Eddie comes on and and, and does an impromptu black. Um, if there are some of those things where it you guys made it look like the turnaround between either a comment or an event, something was ridiculously fast. And I know you're you're all world renowned top of the heap when it comes to talent musicians, but that must have been terribly exciting having to react that quickly and, and almost almost problem solve uh, to try and get some of these moments. Um, oh, yeah. uh, did you yeah. just, were you guys just so good that it looked spontaneous or was yes. some of it spontaneous? No, no, it was, we were so good that it could be spontaneous. That's, that's really how it was. It was, um, I mean, like in the beginning, you know, like the whole style of it was all new to me. Like I said, that gig was it was so expansive for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I learned so much, including how to hear quickly. And because at first I was petrified. I'm like, what do you mean? Let's play that. We didn't rehearse that. That's not on the. <laughs> and I, I would be terrified. I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to play this on television. And I never heard it before. <laughs> like, you know, and then. <laughs> You know, it's just like jump in the water and swim. That's yep. literally what it was. And then after a few times of doing that, then I just said, okay, it's not going to change. So <laughs> I just got to get with it. And this uh, is a really good time to talk about Paul. Uh, Don just brought up as, as well. Sting's Field of Golds was another one that Fields of Gold. Uh, that was another yeah. one. Um, oh, Richard Dreyfus mentioned Child is the Father to the Man, which became the Cape thing. I want to talk about the Cape thing for sure. <laughs> okay. um, but early on here, so you're seeing Paul operate here. You're part of this. You definitely are stretching yourself, playing without a net in some ways. Um, I, I have uh, submitted, uh, when I was in grade two or three, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to Letterman, uh, my friend of mine's father, I should say. He loved it. And he said, he look at Paul Schaefer. And he had done something in the radio business and known Paul back in Canada, back in the day. And he goes, mark my words, that man has the greatest ear of any musician on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that being a little kid, seeing my friend's dad tell me that. Um, and, and I mean, it's been evident when you watch Paul and how quickly... You know, the understanding that he's a prodigy, but it, it just his ear is so incredible. Um, you saw that firsthand right away. Were you surprised by it or did his uh, reputation already precede him? Um, I got to see, you know, more in depth what it was, because I, I really, you know, it's hard to tell when you're just a, a member of the television viewing yeah. public, like, you know, like yeah. how this man you know, what his true genius is. But when you work with him, that's when you see, you know, for sure. Because I didn't, I didn't know when I used to just tune in uh, to TV and just see him play. You know, we just saw the finished product on television. Yeah. But when you're working with him and you just see how quick, yeah, whoever, who said that? He's got the, the quickest. Uh, it was, it was, I was over at my friend's house for a sleepover and the dad was, he was an early adopter of Letterman and mm -hmm. he had worked with Paul Schaefer years ago, either it's maybe in the radio business he had run into him or somehow some way. Right. And he had gotten to see Paul do his thing and, and knew that he wasn't uh, a theory trained musician in the, in the classical sense. And, and, and basically said, you know, they're, you know, and Canadians are, Canadians are like that. We're happy when, when one of our own does well down South, we're always like congratulatory. We're like, yeah, go team Canada. So, so he was really proud to see Paul doing what he was doing 
And he kind of proclaimed that to me. And I'm this little kid looking up at him saying this. And it's like, okay. Well, so, the father, the father wasn't classically trained or he was saying, no, Paul he said wasn't. Paul wasn't. Well, actually I do believe Paul was, he was as okay. A, as a child, I'm pretty sure Paul was classically trained. Okay. You know, but um, most of his, of course, his, his, uh, education. Yeah. <laughs> His real education, you know, came from playing rock and roll as as a teenager. You know, that was the music he fell in love with, and um, he learned everything. And I think he had a he had a band when he was a teenager. They were called the Fugitives. I saw a picture once. He he was so cute. And um, <laughs> yeah, he just Paul. Yeah, I think Paul. First of all, from being classically trained, yes, you know, he was a little virtuoso as a kid. And yes. then using that those skills to learn songs off the radio and television and play, all, you know, all of the rock and roll hits that were coming out, yes. just really fine tuned his ear. So by the time he got thirty years in, right, you know, twenty years in, yeah, you know, it was instantaneous. And and I can attest to that. Like once you start doing that, when you're on that hot seat every day, and it's like. Okay, we're gonna play this right quick. Here are the chords: C, G, F minor, sharp, diminished, abolished nine. And like you know, <laughs> okay, count it off: three, four, bam, and you're live. And it's like, oh shit! Yeah. You know, when you do that every single day, yes, your ear gets really, really fast. And, and at rehearsal too, like we, you know, we would listen to stuff that we're gonna play for the play-ons and stuff. And you, you know, we've only got like twenty minutes or something like that to get the whole show together that we're going to do. Um, so, you, you know, you better hear it fast. You know, you don't have, you don't have 20 minutes to go play that again. I'm sorry, rewind that. Let me hear it one more time. Yeah. You, know, you got to catch it the first time. And, um, you know, after, you know, after a year of that or six months of that, you, you, you're pretty quick. You're pretty quick. I want to talk about that because apparently you were the person uh, who would be able to isolate parts and then sing them to people while they were feverishly writing their charts out. Apparently you were the, the go-to gal on that. Uh, did that happen fairly recently? Like you got sharp within the first couple of years or is that something that developed later? Well, actually that happened in the beginning because I would use that to save my ass. Because, <laughs> when, because there were so many songs that I just had no clue. I'm like, I don't know that song. I never heard of the bold brummels or whatever they're called, you know. Like, <laughs> like I, so I would start calling songs that I do. And this was before we had the, you know, long before the internet where we could download stuff and hear it. Like, you know, so yeah, oh yeah. I, I would just di you know, dish out the parts. And and the very first time I did it, I think is what solidified their trust in me because. It, uh, Chris Catan, who used to be on Saturday Night Live, yep, was, was the guest, and Paul was like, "Okay, what can we play for him?" So I said, "Well, you know, one of his characters is called the Mango." I was just gonna and say, was, "Mango themselves, absolutely." <laughs> and I was always trying to get us to play Mandrill or Shaka Khan. So I said, "Mandrill's got a song called Mango Me. Let's play it." And so the band, you know, Paul and they they never heard that. But growing up, I knew that was a huge hit. Yep. If you know, for of that genre. Yep. Huge hit. So I just gave everybody the beat. The, you know, I gave Anton, here's the hi-hat, here's the kick, here's the snare. Da, 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 da. Here, here's the horn parts. Here's the three, the three horn harmonies. Here's the sax part. Here's the trombone. Here's the trumpet. And you know, here's the bass line. And and, and I just copped like maybe the couple of minutes of the intro for us to play like once the group started. Yep. And the next day I came into the guys, cause I'd listened to it on television. It sounded great. And I brought the CD of Mandrill CD anthology in the next day to the guy's dressing room. I said, fellas, I said, I want you to hear how great you are. And I put that on and they all thought it was a recording from the night before. I said, that's Mandrill. And Chez was like, that's not us. I said, no, but you guys, that's what you sounded like, you know, yesterday. So after that, Paul trusted me. Well, that is so cool. Um, 
Yeah, I, 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 I just appreciate the uh, the picture that you're painting for us of the the camaraderie of of how many people knew um, in the band. Y'all had uh, you had your lane, and and you knew what that was, and 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 learning that is uh, fascinating to me. How how you gelled, um, and and how quickly you did it. Uh, how quickly was it that you became? uh that band where you were really specific on guests who were coming out like the first couple of years i mean th especially because of all the the attention on the late night wars and all of that the the, the late show with david letterman was uh, i mean uh, arguably the most uh the hottest show on television even though it was started at 11 35 at night all the biggest stars in the world were coming on um were you guys loose like okay we know so and so so and so's coming on tomorrow we're gonna play a clever uh reference that people may or may not get uh for when they walk out the walkout music is that something that you did right away or is that something that developed later that developed later because in the very beginning we were not loose there was nothing loose about it yeah you know like everybody was like because it was a brand new show and everyone was like you know kind of nervous like just you know paying tension to every detail and just like on our P's and Q's and just pins and needles. And, you know, yep. it was, it was kind of nerve wracking in the very beginning. Then as the show started to settle in, because yep. one of the brilliant things about Dave Letterman is that he had his show um, taped in real time. Yes. We weren't there all day long. Yep. And then they put together the show, you know, in time to go on the air at 1130. I mean, we literally, like, we would start taping at 4.30 and we were done at 5.30, the, yep. an hour. For, and, you know, they had it down to a science because they'd been doing it for years. And I think it was a lot of the same crew that came over from NBC. Definitely. So yeah. they knew how to just, by then they, they just kind of had it down. And that was one of the things I love about um, Letterman's comfort level, that he could do that in the very beginning with the new show yeah we'd be there for hours all day but that was just the first few weeks like pretty much right away they got it down to where it's like okay here's our schedule we come in at 2 30 and we got we come on stage at 2 50 we rehearse our part of the show and then the guest artist comes on and we rehearse with them for 45 minutes and then we go upstairs and get ready for the show and then we come back down, do the warm up, tape it. At, done at five thirty, we're walking out the door at five thirty. I've heard on many interviews, um, you guys talking about upstairs versus you know rehearsing in the theater, and 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 I I just want to get a picture for um for those of us who are Letterman nerds that just care about this stuff. What was upstairs like? I hear that there was instruments and stuff. Like, was it offices? Did you all have your own individual office? Was there an actual uh like sort of a rehearsal space a little bit up there as well, or what? What was upstairs? Upstairs, and see, you had the theater, and then yep. you had the office built. Yep. Now I can't really speak too much about the you know the office building because I didn't I wasn't over there that much. Once in a yeah. while I'd go over there to see somebody. Sure. Know. But for the most part, my day took place in the actual theater. Okay. And we would rehearse on stage. Yep. Um, because we had you know we had our monitor engineer Larry Zinn. He would be part of the rehearsals. Yeah. And um and I think Tomo, who did the front front of house I think he was part of our rehearsals too yeah and um so after we got done rehearsing on the stage we'd go behind the stage and go through the doors that went to the elevator yep the second floor you know one flight up was Dave's dressing yep and um then I forgot was what was on the third floor but the fourth floor was the guy's band room it was a huge room and all, you know, and there was a big, a second room inside of that huge room where we kept our instruments. Right. And then the fifth floor was the makeup and hair. Yeah. And uh, the number one guest dressing. Room. And then the sixth floor was the other guests dressing. Room. Yeah. And the seventh floor was my dressing. Room. And I also had some guitars up on the seventh floor too, as well as in the band closet. How many guitars have you had there? At the, what was the record number of guitars that you had between the stage 
your private dressing room and the upstairs room, how many guitars did you personally have there? Probably about 40, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm getting rid of now because there's just no reason for me to have some. You're getting guitars. rid of your guitars? Yeah, yeah. It took a while to come to that, you know, decision. But um, I really don't, I mean, I love them all. I really do. And, um, but there's just no reason for me to have that many guitars anymore. So, okay. I so I got to ask you this, how are you getting rid of them? Like, are you gifting sure. them to certain people the way that uh, Warren gifted, you know, kind of his guitar to Dave? Like, are you giving them as special might, presents to people or are you don't, might, are you auctioning? I might, I might, um, I might gift, gift a few, you know, because I thought about that. I said, I, I know I'm going to end up giving, so for me to give somebody a guitar, I, I don't, if it's not, maybe it won't be so big to the the receiver, but for me, it is like the hugest thing I could do. That's how I view it. I'm a collector. So when you say this, that to me is a big fucking deal. Like that's a, yes. that's like, like I'm thinking. If I give thinking, you a guitar, that is saying something. Oh yeah. You like better that, believe that is like the. It's sacred. You could, you could never, ever, or you, I'll say you should never, ever question how I feel about you if I give you a guitar. <laughs> okay. Wow. Like I said, the receiver, I don't know. They might not see it the same way. Like, oh, no, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, yeah. If ever you decide to uh, to auction something off, or if you want to do it that way, if, if ever you're going to um, bestow uh, one of these treasures to somebody that way, let us know and we'll make sure that we, you know, broadcast it. Uh, you know, our voice is getting bigger every day. Hopefully we'll be able to be at the point where it's like, yeah, somebody from the show is doing something uh, and, and we can really, really megaphone that out for people. That's uh, okay. Yeah, that's. I'll, I'll probably, you know, unload. A, I'll sell a few of them. Probably, sure. just yeah. I'll probably give some a couple away to somebody that's close to me. A couple people that are close to me. I don't. Know. But there's one. There's only one that I can think of that I would want to, uh, not auction off, but just uh, sell. You know, sell as a big ticket item, and that's the guitar that I had signed at the concert for New York. I had everybody sign, and it's it's a beautiful um, Alvarez Yari guitar. That's a it has no sound hole, so that I, I chose that guitar because there's so much more space for signatures, and it's white like a sheet of paper. And I and I had everyone sign the guitar. Um, first, there was two guitars. And I let everybody know that one one was mine personally, and I got them to sign both at the same time. Everybody who was there, Mick Jagger, Paul McCartney, it, who all the people that I, I can't think of right now, but wow. everyone who was there, David Bowie, everybody, Roger, um, Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend. Yeah, everyone who, who was there. I uh even, even a couple of people it. backstage who, who didn't perform but they were hanging out I even had them saying it. The history that you just talked about right there. Um we'll get back to late show Letterman fans. Don't worry about it, but it's Felicia Collins. I'm going to go all over the place for sure. Uh Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Concert of New York. I mean obviously the, that's a special uh thing unto itself. But but the collaborations uh, and then guests on the show. Um you know, you talk about when you get there, you had this, uh, you know, very specific musical taste. Suddenly you're being stretched all over the place. You're being stretched also with the people that you get a chance to meet, uh, watch perform, or sometimes even collaborate and perform with. Um, those first few years, do you remember any early times where somebody showed up and either you guys were a part of it or you were just bird's eye view to it? And you're like, I can't, Freaking believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm watching this. You're having that religious experience that uh, people who are music fans experience. Um, that theater certainly was uh, a vessel for those types of experiences, whether you were creating them or being a part of them. Do you remember kind of the first time where you remember your first couple times where your mind was stretching going, I can't believe I'm seeing this? Yeah. I mean, probably from day one. I mean, it just, it, Mike, it happened literally on a daily basis. What, what you're describing, it happened every single day. Every single day. I, I I would just be, at first I would approach it 
you know, as work. Like I, I didn't have time to, to go there in my head yep. until I got the music down. And then I would look up and go, oh my God, <laughs> I'm playing my girl with the temptations. Like it just <laughs> stuff like that, would it would just blow me away. And it would happen every day, every yeah. single day. It was just amazing. I, I, I was just so, I was so happy. And, and I, you know, for me, doing something that's that fulfilling brings out the best of me. I mean, I'll, I'll get there early. I'll learn all the stuff. You know, I do a better job at something I love. Absolutely. <laughs> than like, you know, being a, a cashier at Macy's or some shit. You sure. Know, like when, I, when I was 17, I hated it. So you know, I'd be like, I mean, yeah, yeah, whatever. Try that. <laughs> you know, I didn't care. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think about some of the, the, the early, not just early, but all the time um, throughout the show when like, I think about buddy guy, cause he was early on John Popper and some of these people who would show up and play with you guys uh, early on. Like um, I think you had known buddy guy before, before late show. Didn't you, you had known nope. him before. No, you yeah. didn't. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. So there you go. Suddenly did you find out a week before? Oh yeah. Buddy's going to come in and play with right. us next week. Like, is that what it was? Yeah, pretty much. We would, yeah, we'd find out like a, about a week ahead of time and we would get, you know, a copy of the music that we were uh, going to learn. It usually be somebody with a new CD out. Sure. So we, you know, in the beginning, like, like I said, before we, before there was a such thing as the internet, we would get CDs. Yeah. So my CD I got about a thousand of them in my parents' house. I know what you're yeah. talking about. My CD collection went from like four <laughs> to like about two thousand. Because and then and like if it was the same artist coming on to do another song off the same album, we'd get the CD again. So I would end up with doubles, and I had to keep buying in in my apartment. I had to keep buying um, what do you call it? Like shelves, you know, tall yeah. bookshelves, if you will. Yep. For the CDs and then yep. have to re-alphabetize them all. Like I have <laughs> one whole wall of just nothing but CDs. <laughs> I can't even, I'd, I'd need three lifetimes just to listen to them all. Yeah. Me too. I can't get rid of mine though. Like my music yeah. collection is so, like I was the kid in my early 20s that would hang out at the music store. And, 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 and we would drive to Vancouver to see gigs uh, of indie bands and all that kind of stuff. Music was just my, it was, it was, it was, it was, I feel like I, the psychological problems that I don't have now are as a result of all the release that I got early on because of music. And just, I love yeah. music so much. Um, I can't get rid of my CDs. I just, they're, they're just too, they're too tied to me. Um, right. So I know what you're talking about. Uh, I, I, uh, I think about some of those early, early times, uh, the collaborations, what the show did. I want to go back to Dave loving music. Um, Dave, uh, you know, he asks for all, uh, legendarily asked for all sorts of different, sometimes offbeat, sometimes uh, if it was, he was going through something in his life uh, and a song meant something to him. Hey, can the band insert that in there? Mm -hmm. um, was that a, an occurrence that would happen weekly monthly is that something that uh that, that even hit your radar or did you go directly oh, to Paul with it it hit my radar it, I, I could I could see immediately um the connection between Paul Schaefer being there and David Letterman it being his show I, it, because of David that that even opened up where you could have I think anybody else, it would have been another big band kind of thing, because that's how they all were. That was the format. Yep. But I think that if I was to guess, I never really had this discussion with anyone, but if I was to guess from my, from my perch, from my vantage point, um, it was David Letterman's love of music and what music meant to him in his life uh, is what caused there to be a world's most dangerous band. I really yeah. do believe that. He picked Paul because he knew Paul would deliver what he had in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he and he knew so much music. And another thing I didn't know until after being there was Dave's got perfect pitch. And I don't even know what? if Dave... I don't... Overcoat and underpants.